HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Steward, equipping regenerative farms with the capital they need to grow. Learn more at gosteward.com. Hello, this is Lisa Held, and you're listening to The Farm Report, a Heritage Radio Network show about the people, processes, and policies that shape how food is produced today. Whether they've grazed on grass their entire lives, been raised in an organic system, or lived on a conventional dairy farm, the vast majority of dairy cows get sold into the commodity beef system when they're retired and get integrated into the same cheap meat supply. With Butter Meat Co., Jill Gould is betting on a different model. By selling retired organic dairy cows directly in her local community in western New York and online, she's working to get struggling organic dairies higher prices for their animals while getting more flavorful and environmentally friendly beef to consumers. In this episode, I talked to Jill about eating beef from dairy cows, the economic proposition for farmers, and what the model might mean for the planet. Okay, Jill, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So I I was thinking before this conversation about the name of your company, first of all, and <laughs> I I love it, um, Butter Meat Co. And I was just thinking, I, I wanted to hear from you, if, like what response you get from people when you tell them that's the name? Because in my mind, I was thinking, wow, you kind of took the two foods that Americans love the most and <laughs> stuck them together. <laughs> Are people really excited when they hear the name? Yeah, I'd say as long as they're not keeping kosher, because then they're like butter and meat is like a horrible thing, but they usually get a good <laughs> chuckle out of it. Um, but yeah, butter and meat, I guess I liked it. My product is beef from dairy cows. So um, the product they make, it's dual purpose kind of by the name. If you said it was butter meat, I wouldn't correct you. Um, and it's just, it's butter. It's delicious. It's flavorful. Um, and it's a cooking ingredient, like it all just kind of goes together. Um, and I think it kind of, it's friendly and approachable, which I feel like in meat and protein right now, that's not always necessarily what you think of. So having some names that it's like fun and approachable was, um, important to me to kind of establish in the brand. So definitely makes sense. Um, so we're going to talk a lot more about, um, your company and, and what you do and how you do it. Uh, before we do that, um, let's just talk a little bit about you and how you got into this. So, um, I read that you grew up on a farm. Um, what kind of farm was it? Tell us about what that was like. Yeah, I grew up on a primarily vegetable farm. Um, it's a larger production, um, like ship truckloads of cabbage type vegetable farm, um, to like major retailers. So I often joke that, um, my mom was a farmer and my dad was a truck driver, which is how they met. And, um, fighting over pallets and like order quantities and rejections was like dinner conversation in my life. So when I talk about working as food supply chain, um, and that kind of thing, um, that's what I did. So, I mean, I come from a long line of farmers, um, and also like refrigeration and truck drivers, which are essential. Um, so that stuff's all near and dear to me. Um, and yeah, studied agriculture Cornell and, um, worked at national at, at Walmart and global food sourcing. I figured I wanted to learn how they did it. Um, and how food moves around. And um, 
Blue Apron in a sourcing role as well. Um, wanted to go see the opposite, like super small farms out of the Hudson Valley. Like how do you get that into a meal kit and help people cook more at home, which was such an important piece of all this work. Um, I just wanted to learn about food systems and agriculture and how it all comes together. And, right. uh, yeah, now, um, my, my husband's a dairy farmer, a organic dairy farmer. And so I'm in partnership with him and my in-laws and started Butter Meat Co. So, so, so you're at living on a dairy farm now and it's, it's, you, as you said, your, your husband's dairy farmer. Are you, do you also farm as well? Do you work on the farm? I like joke. I'm a special project manager at the moment. (laughs) Like we just got off a call with a new payroll company that we're like onboarding to support payroll. So, um, no, I'm not in the day to day. I'm more in like a cerebral role, special project manager. Um, getting butter meat co off the ground is the core of my day. So. Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, and what does the farm that you're on today, what does that look like? Um, we are certified organic dairy with four milking robots. We're about 230 milking animals. Um, we ship our milk to upstate Niagara, which our milk ends up under national brands, private label, um, and organic milk. And we have about 600 acres of certified organic crops. So we are growing our own crops. Um, we do have some corn and soybeans and I guess all kinds of different stuff. Um, to feed a primarily forage diet. We're grazing in the summers. Um, what else? Yeah. The pasture is, I think Steve's passion. Um, and yeah, that's, and you're, I was just going to say you're in, um, you're close to Perry, New York. And that's, that's kind of, I think for listeners, it would the closest like landmark be Buffalo. Yeah. We're right in between Buffalo and Rochester. Um, Genesee okay. County. That's where I grew up. Um, my business, Better Meat Co., is based in Wyoming County, which has, it's the number one agricultural county in New York State. Um, it has more cows than people. And um, <laughs> I guess the other landmark here is Letchworth State Park. That was why I kind of chose to put the business's retail experience here because there's over, there's close to a million tourists a year to Letchworth from Buffalo, Rochester, and New York City. So um, in terms of people curious about food or wanting to interact with like a farmer, uh, it felt like there was the foot traffic here um, and COVID kind of really even cemented that with um, people looking for outdoor recreation opportunities. So our farm's about 10 miles north of Perry um, in Pavilion. So. Okay. So you grew up on a farm, um, you live on a farm now, but you also left and, and kind of worked and, and learned the inner workings of food systems. Tell me about the moment when you decided uh, to start Butter Meat Co. What was the inspiration for this particular idea? The idea started over dinner with some friends that were visiting from Washington, D.C. Um, my friend Iwa and his now wife Miriam kind of unexpectedly showed up and they're chefs and foodies and have their own food business in D.C. called Number One Sons. And um, I had nothing to eat and I was almost like embarrassed with Iwa. You're like, oh, I have nothing. And um I was like, we just have steaks from the farm and kind of like sheepishly because there at the time I was so brainwashed that like dual purpose beef and dairy beef was like so terrible that like only farmers ate it. And it's terrible logic that is like ingrained culturally, even in agricultural communities. But Mm. um, you all like jumped up like it was going to be the best meal he's had all year. And my (laughs) husband and I were just like, okay, you are such a city guy. Kind of like, you know, he's so city. and um whatever we got a good laugh but Ewok cooked it and it just he was so ecstatic and I saw what we raised at our own farm in such a different light which you just need someone to bring a fresh perspective and after he left um Steve was really gung-ho about it all and I kind of go like let's go study the data you know and um USDA data cow numbers in New York State like where's everything going And, and this was 2019 so it was before kind of the whole beef I don't know, 2020 just changed protein and people's awareness, but um, sure. I could see that like, you know, there's just the, the classic stuff we talk about today, the scale and consolidation. And I was like, I can carve a niche. Like I just need a niche, <laughs> like give me a <laughs> niche. Um, and we have a niche. We make a premium product and we're just selling it at a livestock auction. And it's just getting mixed into the regular beef supply chain. And um, I just saw it as like leakage from our local economy and like environmental system. And, you know, so 
I, the data was like what kind of pushed me over the edge. It was just like, yeah, we can make a niche and we should be differentiating this product because it's different what we raise here in the Northeast from a dairy perspective from other parts of the country. So um, we slaughtered our first cows that spring. And then um, I guess I filed the LLC and the name came like that summer, Butter Meat Co. So um, I took dinner with some friends that just said, you know, and at the time there was some DC restaurants that had, they were calling it like call dairy cow. There were some far, fancy farm to table restaurants starting to feature it and talk about it. And I saw the menus and I was like, that should be our cows. Like, mm-hmm. like we need to get them there. So uh, we were kind of off to the races. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think it's a really interesting space because I don't think most people realize that well, first of all, Americans already eat a lot of beef from dairy cows, right? Yeah. Like there's, I, I looked up the stat when I was doing some reporting on this for food print um, a while back. And, you know, I, I found the stat that in 2018, the dairy sector contributed 5.6 billion pounds of beef to the commercial beef supply in the U.S., which was 21%, which is like a pretty decent chunk, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, but you're doing it differently because essentially... Like the main difference is instead of taking your dairy cows that you're retiring and bringing them, like you said, to auction and like putting them into sort of, they get, they probably get just turned into like cheap ground beef, right? In some cases, you don't always know like food service, but they're ending up at JBS in Cargill in Pennsylvania is where they're going. (laughs) Okay. But you're Uh, saying like, here we are doing organic dairy, the, the cows are happy, they're healthy. Like why not get more of that dollar, right? By like selling the beef directly yeah yeah why not and it's you know it's a different nutritional profile because the animals live longer um as well as the environmental component of eating a dual purpose animal and i think the last thing i just add on that is that dairy farmers are raising more and more what you call dairy steers so once you have enough milking animals on your farm and your pipeline is pretty steady and the dairy industry's gotten very good at making more milk per animal so as you have enough animals for milking kind of volume breeding back to a dairy steer, which some of the genetics, they basically take a whole steen, a black and white cow, and its calf is black, <laughs> which automatically makes it worth more at the livestock auction. That whole <laughs> segment is growing because you can't have milk currently without an animal reproducing. So they're reproducing and pushing out more dairy steers from the dairy system. And it was like, why not create a market for those dairies, you know, a brand and a market to choose. Cause we just, our, our beef is so homogenized. You don't know what breed age, where it was from, what it ate. Um, for that's the reality of beef right now, <laughs> for, unless you're making very conscious decisions. Um, you have no idea even what country <laughs> actually right now. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, so the, the meat that you're selling now from, um, butter meat co, is it coming, exclusively from your dairy farm or are you also buying animals from other farms around you? Yeah, currently we're all sourcing from our dairy farm. When I first started and into 2020, we did source from some other farms and it made things incredibly complicated between the organic paperwork, kind of consolidating transporting animals. And I felt like at the moment it was, it was too complicated for the size of the business I was. So in 2021, focused on only using all of our own call animals or mature animals. I don't really, I try not to use the word call, um, but mature cows. <laughs> so um, it's all from our farm currently. Um, so we'll see. I'm looking forward to growing capacity with outside farms, but I am running into slaughter bottlenecks and that whole processing, but that's kind of widely being talked about today. So, Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Has that been a major challenge, especially since COVID? Because, you know, we hear from a lot of farmers that, they're just having a really hard time getting animals processed in time. Yes, there's um, the first slaughterhouse I started out with in 2019 had a fallout and shut down in New York. And oh my was gosh. out of commission. Yeah. And then I, I ended up exclusively going to Pennsylvania, which I'm still going to Pennsylvania just across the border. But just this fall, one of them lost their USDA for human handling situation, which is kind of the people you want doing this work and that are willing to do the work then run into regulatory stuff, which you're just like, this is, it's, it's just sad because I talk a lot about the volume of the beef industry is so consolidated and so based on volume. Um, the scale, a lot of these smaller family owned slaughterhouses operate at just, 
you know, there isn't quite the volume coming through of animals to like really make a punch. So when one, you know, is offline in a region, you're like, geez. So um, there's some in the works around here. I'm really exploring what it looks like getting USDA slaughtered beef and doing my own USDA processing um, to kind of increase my volume overall. But that challenge is way more real today than it was two years ago when I first started because there's maybe there might be less capacity at the moment in New York and Pennsylvania than there was two years ago from a USDA cow perspective. So Got there's it. a lot of well, money yeah. in the pipeline. Someone like everyone's talking about it. I'm like, everyone's talking about it, but there's so few people actually doing the work. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and it takes so long like to get, you know, there's all this money coming out of the government right now in terms of grants for like local processing. But when you think about, you know, if someone's going to build like a new small, uh, you know, plant, that's going to take years, right? Probably I know. Before or there's the running. retrofitting yeah. the old, there's a facility in New York. I read it's a currently a custom, there's a next generation, they're on board to go USDA. And they said, it's still going to take them 18 months. Oh this my is an gosh. Existing and that's, slaughterhouse. Yeah. You know, so there are some units out West that a company called Freeslow builds that are, they're built like a mobile unit. Not they, they built mobile use begin with, but these are like trailers solder mm-hmm. trailers so you consolidate like four of them together to make like a processing facility and that's the quickest way at the moment without to build some type of capacity but yeah we're we're yeah we're two years away from more local infrastructure of any significant volume so um yeah it's it's it's, it's a long road ahead there's a lot of hype at the moment you're like how do we take this hype and make it real assets um, it's definitely where there's a lot of work to be done. Right. It'll be a little while before we know um, how much of a difference all this investment really makes, it seems yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This episode of The Farm Report is brought to you by Steward. It's tough for local farms, ranches, fisheries, and producers to access the capital they need to propel themselves forward or to sustain themselves at all. Steward is transforming agriculture by equipping regenerative farms and food producers with the resources they need to grow. Founded in 2017, Steward offers flexible loans and expert support services to human-scale agriculture businesses that are looking to scale their operations, improve the health of their lands, and bolster local food systems. But they don't do it alone. Their innovative lending platform brings together a community of values-driven individuals who join in their mission by participating in loans that fuel this growth. Learn more, apply for a loan, or lend support at gosteward.com. All right, we're back. You're listening to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network. I've been speaking to Jill Gould, the founder of Butter Meat Co. So Jill, I want to talk more about the actual eating of what you call dual purpose beef. You mentioned earlier that there's kind of this um this idea, especially even in agricultural communities that beef from dairy cows is not good, right? It's not delicious. Um, and I saw like on your website that you say, uh, we produce local organic beef from cows who have lived their lives to the absolute fullest. I thought that was really interesting because in my past reporting, people have told me that some of the thinking around dairy cow meat, um, being tough, for instance, was based on, um, conventional dairy cows that had been pushed in production and were kind of worn out. So like tough life equals tough meat kind of thing. Um, what what do you think about that? Like, have you have you found that that is true? Um, how how do you think about the the flavor um, of an organic dairy cow? And and does like you know the organic part matter? Oh, have you ever tried dual purpose mature beef? I no. have not actually. Okay. I just I just care. I, uh, because it's it, too bad I don't have some right now. And we can I'm do gonna a have taste. to make that happen because I guess yeah. it is. Um, it is full of flavor and just so beefy. Like our beef is so mild today because the cows we eat are, or cows steers 
for the most part are 13 to max 30 months of age. So it's incredibly mild. Um, I always kind of talk about if you have customers, if you think about veal is very pale, like pinkish. Um, if I go to the grocery store and see beef, it looks like mildly red. Um, it's very pale still. Um, if I take one of our steaks or even our ground beef, it's almost more like a maroon color. Um, and if you kind of keep going to the next level, venison would be like super dark and kind of that gamey meat. Um, but just the smell, you can almost like smell the grass. And um, I give customers the Good Meat Project actually as a meat tasting guide. So in our kind of like American beef culture, we don't actually have a lot of words to even describe beef or like flavors we taste. And it's, it has the same flavor nuance or terroir that cheese, milk, um, wine even does. So um, part of kind of like talking about beef and flavor profiles is just looking at how do you articulate that? Or, you know, we love the word tough and that's like the only word we know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's it's like, so funny. when you start, it's like kind of goofy. You're like, wow, we don't even like, if you eat a steak, how would you describe it? We really only have a handful of words that come to mind and tough is one of them. Um, I prefer long chew or short chew. Uh, cause different <laughs> muscles also change that texture. Um, and I could give you a cut that's going to take tough even from a young animal. So, um, mm. kind of just like thinking about being aware of that. Um, if you could cut a long grain muscle and you would literally not be able to chew it, it doesn't matter how old the cow is or the lifestyle it, it, it lived. Um, so it is fun. I like to give people the same, a, a cut of two cuts from like the same cow. So you can appreciate how the muscle actually changes that experience less the animal. We put a lot of emphasis on animal. So, um, that being said, the beef has a very full beefy flavor profile. Um, even in the raw state, it's, it's got a nice scent. Um, people, I mean, even the slaughterhouse, they like know our beef. And they say, it, you know, it, it smells delicious. So, um, specifically to what the cows eat, um, as a certified organic farm, you've got to have a minimum 30% of your dry matter intake. This is like the regulation I should say uh, yeah. from pasture. So we usually exceed that Steve, you know, you want to get grass is cheap, really, if you're making milk. So the more grass, um, and sure. short as you eat, um, they do get some corn at the robot as their incentive. So they're not hundred percent grass fed, but when we did our, we did nutritional testing, which I'm happy to kind of share with you, um, the actual science, uh, Mm. We exceeded the vitamin A in like grass fed beef because but it was up, it was 200% higher. And it's kind of just like this bioaccumulation, like these cows are getting, you know, four plus years, which is like a minimum double what your quote unquote grass fed beef um, ah. is getting. So that's where this whole like new, I think about the density of nutrition is so different when you're kind of thinking about the environmental, you know, how does that change for human health too? Um, and that kind of equation together, um, in addition to kind of just the quality of the beef. So, um, I think that's I really interesting. Questions. Yeah. yeah it's so yeah. interesting. It, yeah. It's like, we're not talking about the nutrient density in proteins. And that to me is, that's why we're raising these animals. It's like right. they're for food, but we have less nutrient dense proteins today. Um, then yeah because for centuries we ate dual purpose animals the idea of a single purpose animal has really been around for like 150 years um and it, it did start really you know we invented it we're so good at making efficient food um yeah which is, so yeah i well yeah yeah another part of that which probably has a similar history is like you hear people say oh um the breed matters right mm -hmm. like we use different breeds of um cattle for beef and different ones for dairy. Um, is that kind of, we just invented that too? Like, like what, how does that affect the taste at all? Um, in, in terms of the breed changing the flavor, the only one I've seen is really jerseys. Um, they have more of the beta carotene in their fat and, and you can visually tell a Jersey steak, um, and visually with your eyes, cause flavor, we take in organic leptic is the word. When we look at food, it's like how it looks, how it feels, how it tastes. Um, and so all those factors, you can kind of identify like a Jersey versus a Holstein, um, versus like a, a rib steak out of a Holstein, a, a well-trained butcher, butcher can, can identify it, um, in the cut. Most people can't. So, um, the actual breed changing the flavor, the only one I can really say is the Jersey, um, in terms of the cut appearance, a well-trained eye could identify certain cuts but not all cuts, but they're not things that impact the customer so much that 
it's like a barrier I can, I, I know the brand and we can overcome because it's just learning more about your food. Um, I guess okay. one example I give of a cut that like, I don't like to get out of our cows or I don't get out of all our cuts is short ribs. Um, it doesn't matter how heavy the cover is on a Holstein, they are still like skinny in their ribs. You know, they can, they always carry like, they don't. And if you look at like a, a traditional Angus or a single purpose beef breed, the cover on their ribs are just like, they're non-existent. They're like a Tootsie Roll. Um, hmm. And so my product in that case, a short rib from a Holstein is always going to disappoint someone that wants to make this like barbecue short rib out of an Angus. And so we only take the short ribs out of the, the cows that have good cover, but my short rib isn't going to be exactly like an Angus. But, you know, I think there's ways to break down some of the cows. The breed nuances can be compensated for in the processing and, and the marketing. If that makes sense. So. Right. Yeah, that's smart. Um, and and you you know you talked about nutrient density and and started to kind of um, mention the environmental aspect. Um, I obviously, I mean, just kind of off the top of my head, if one animal produces both meat and milk, it seems like you know it's much more efficient um, compared to an animal raised just for beef. Um, is there? Um, I don't know if you have numbers in front of you right now, but but has there been any data on this in terms of you know climate impact of of beef from a from a dual purpose cow? Um, yes, there has been some work. I will say it's primarily like globally focused. The U.S. has not jumped onto some of the dual purpose. I don't want to say concept, but I think prospects because I see it okay. as like such the future of beef and dairy and finding like kind of redefining efficiency. Um, but it's so counterintuitive to how we've really built our whole entire beef system. And, and not that we need to burn that all down today, but like, and that's not what I'm trying to do, which is how do you grow this segment, um, that can keep farms, like you mentioned in the Northeast viable because we have such a different production style than like, we can't compete right now with people out West, uh, how cheap a milk they can make. So how do you start changing that? Um, I kind of think of it as like vernacular, like agriculture, like you talk about vernacular, like architecture and really the future of more resilient food systems and sustainable food and whatever words we want to use is, is more about this, like vernacular, like what makes sense in this region and what are they good sure. at and what do they have and how does that change the environmental um, analysis? So um, we have done some work. I worked with a consultant to do it really more to gut check. Like, am I crazy? Is this like a good climate solution? And the answer was kind of overwhelmingly yes from the current research. Um, dual purpose beef is often left out of a lot of environmental assessments. I won't name any of the big fake meat or I don't want to call it fake meat. The al meat alternative segment does not like sure. to, to cite or acknowledge dual purpose beef because it changes their <laughs> reports. Calculations. Calculations. Um, but so it's often not included in kind of the American environmental asset. I don't know. <laughs> We're trying to figure out how to count that stuff right now. Um, mm. I think you probably run into it. It's like, Oh, is yeah. taking California water and making milk efficient? I don't know. But right now, we're, right. we don't care where water comes from. <laughs> In these conversations, we just assume it's unending. And yeah, whatever. Well, we like a whole you podcast said, about that. <laughs> yeah, well, and it, it really, like you said, so much of it is regional. Like we, we make these sort of measure, we take these measurements and, and cite numbers that are national or global. And then like when you start to look at a, a system, there might be all these factors regionally that make it, more efficient or, you know, make a system make more sense for that place because of the climate there or the resources there, right? Yeah. And that's where I see dual purpose beef in like the Northeast is like particularly makes sense. Um, but that's what, that's why I'm willing to spend my time working on like, you know, building a brand <laughs> and a business. Cause I think, you know, that's how we keep more farms in business here. Cause we're up against, um, the consolidation that's happening in, in livestock production, dairy or beef um, on the yeah, farm I mean, side too. Dairy in the Northeast is, is struggling a lot. And, and we've done, um, we've done uh, quite a, at least a few episodes on the farm report that um, have, have touched on some of the struggles that dairy farmers in the Northeast have been facing over the last several years. Um, and I've covered 
um, organic dairy in the Northeast mm-hmm. quite a bit. Um, you know, there's been this big story in the news just this past year with um, Horizon dropping lots of um, family farms yeah. in the Northeast. And, and even Maple Hill, which was like a small regional um, grass-fed dairy company that is not even that old, has been dropping farms because their economics aren't working. Um, I, let's talk specifically about like, how does butter meat co or just like the idea of of selling um these dairy cows directly as beef like how does it help the farmer um from an economic perspective yeah i think i've got to increase the value i've got to show the value proposition of eating this beef and how it's different which is what i'm working on because we have this like environmental nutritional and like regional economic story um you know, you start building enough of a foundation that like, this is a very compelling product um, that customers don't have access to today. So that's really been my focus this past year and kind of looking to the future. Um, I often think about dairy farms really only have two accounts receivables, which is crazy. (laughs) You get a milk check and you get a livestock check. And so it's like, there's no control really broadly over that milk check. Um, The livestock check is the one that I'm like, you could change that. And it's so consolidated right now. And how do you, um, how do you start tackling that um, and changing that? Because not a lot of people are talking about that right now. So that's kind of where I see mm-hmm. Butter Meat Co. Um, it's like, how do we make those cows more valuable? But this past year, the market's been strong, which, you know, you're always going to have like the strong markets. But because um, kind of like the milk market, our cows are closer to the proximity of the final consumer, which is valuable to the larger processors because you're not transporting, you know, these cows are coming four hours from New York, but it's over like half a million dairy cows a year. (laughs) Um, we're just on trucks going to like, so, um, yeah, it's, I think it's, how do you try to start? What are the levers and the options and the toolkit to, to these farms and changing their accounts receivables or having other options that aren't just kind of like pushed onto them. And, um, I, I think we can do that with butter meat co, um, on the buying side, as soon as we have the, you know, the ability to scale that, which is really what this year is all about from a business standpoint. So is it, is there a, um, a number that you have so far, or is it too soon to say like how much more, um, a dairy farmer could get from an animal sold directly through something like Better Meat Co versus, um, just bringing that same animal to auction to go to a JBS or a Cargill? Yeah, I guess right now, on that like livestock check from the auction, there's kind of like a buyer's fee, you know, there's like all these kind of like fees and different things, which I think we can quickly eliminate, or that's where there's an opportunity right away um, to kind of spread that margin between like a buyer, like butter meat co and the farmer. Um, And I think the other part of that is really more just consistency is the value add um, finding that like consistent point um, year round, knowing what you're going to get broadly farmers kind of know how many they're going to be calling that year. So they kind of can kind of a better projection on what that looks like. Um, and less rely on the market. But I guess you're looking at probably like a, I think ideally like a 30%, but 20 to 30% um, difference there um, from like what you're getting at a a traditional livestock auction to the farm. So we don't pay a lot of beef at retail. That's kind of the, we we have cheap, it's incredible what we've done in terms of how cheap, there's not a lot of margin anywhere in the process. Um, Right. So has that been a challenge for you in terms of selling the beef, um, like competing on price? Sometimes, but now three or almost three years in, it's kind of like they're not my customer because um, mm. they don't value that this product for what it is. Um, I used to, but COVID really, 2020 like opened up people's eyes, I think, to the, the realities of the smaller beef world um, and the role we play because like Wegmans had no beef and I turned my phone off because <laughs> we were, <laughs> Cause we, you were so busy. We were so, we, I had not a pound of beef left. Like my freezers wow. were empty. So, you know, there was like that moment for customers, like your local people, like a real person, you know, that can get you food. Like I was talking to someone else. We had this like glory day of like March 30th to like, june of like the local food systems and then i don't know we started it just we had it was like people realized and it was like we got to help feed people and like do anything and that's what we did um it was i don't know so yeah that was crazy 
and it, my pricing didn't change. I didn't have a lot of inflation in my system. You know, that's the other thing. We have all this beef inflation and um, I, we just tweaked some pricing the other day and it was a tweak more around just managing, moving through whole cows. It wasn't that I needed to, my prices hadn't, you know, we had some price changes at the slaughterhouse, but like, it's not the same level of inflation that we're seeing in the larger beef world. Um, one of my friends was like, it's like 17% was reported. And I was like, dang, you know, I wouldn't even, yeah. But like, that's where you need, that's resiliency is because I, I didn't need to do that yet. Or like, I hope I don't have to, I don't want to do it. Um, we've done, I take food stamps and EBT at the shop. Um, and then we've kind of done, it's really more of like a mutual aid type relationship with the local food pantry. Um, so they get a voucher to come get ground beef or, um, and milk actually right now this month. So being affordable and I think accessible is important to me. And I think there are ways to do that working with other partners. Um, so yeah, today I don't, I don't, it used to bother me. I'd be like, Oh, I gotta be honest. Like, no, we gotta, you gotta have, you gotta, you gotta have margin so you can keep building something different. Um, and I try to do a lot in the community so that customers see that dollar. I guess I'm obsessed with the circular economy idea, especially in food. Um, cause it, it's here. So we, yeah, I try to do a lot there. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're doing this in, you know, one, one spot in the Northeast in, in New York state. And, um, there are some other, um, companies with, a you know, similar, maybe not exactly the same model on the West coast. Um, I, I know of one organic dairy in Maryland that, that does, um, a similar thing and, and brings its grass-based, um, dairy cattle to a local butcher shop and, you know, sells that as grass-fed beef. It, it seems like there's a little bit of momentum, um, around dual purpose beef. Um, what do you think needs to happen for this approach to, catch on, um, you know, in more regions around the country? Right now it's customer awareness. When I say that, you know, it's just so simple that like first, I always, when I first started, I was like, make people curious about the beef, whether they want to try it because of the flavor or they want to try it because they, you know, there's um, kind of like food explorers was the, I, the idea I was using, like, just explore beef. Like, I don't care what you eat. I don't care. If it's an impossible burger. I don't care. Explore, like develop that palate. Um, cause it, it's, it's all helps move us towards like different options, which I think are powerful, um, for customers and producers. So, um, creating that niche, uh, I guess I hope that, and I struggle with this. We don't have good branding and terminology, like dual purpose, mature, uh, yeah. aged on the hoof. Like the list of ways to describe this product is a thing I have to work on, but I hope it's all butter meat. Like it's just butter meat yeah. from a dairy cow. Um, so kind of just like having something to help communicate that and educate that. But right now we have like a huge awareness. And I mean, I keep joking that like the, the dairy checkoff money should be going towards the dairy beef development or just like the beef, like every farmer in New York state that sells a cow at a livestock auction, which are all dairy cows from dairy farms goes to the beef checkoff program that works every day to devalue your product. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So it we is. could, we could like the Titanic, like we can, I think getting more, I don't want to say like big picture people in our food system aware of this idea. And, um, you could start just bringing awareness so customers could choose it even, but it's, I see a big awareness problem, I guess. And that's kind of what I'm trying to work on. So. Well, you're definitely contributing because I can, I can tell you that for sure, butter meat sounds more appealing than dual purpose. Beef. Yeah, I so, know it's yeah. terrible. Cause then some people say, well, so, yeah. Holstein is not a dual purpose breed. If you get into the breed people, uh, you um, know, Normandy, like those are, historical dual purpose breeds. But so when you say you're taking a single purpose animal and making it a dual purpose, but they're all dual purpose because they're all still going to beef. They don't go to some cow funeral, like in India, they save them right. all. Like we don't do that here. So they're all yeah. dual purpose, but yeah, you could have different conversations, with different people. So, you know, and I think getting some of the land grants kind of working on it would be amazing. I'm trying to really knock on Cornell's door to just get, um, some energy excitement there, but the semen salesmen all know about it. Those are my favorite people to talk about the, cause they see how the beef industry is changing with the, the dairy steers. So. Mm. Um, 
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I really appreciate all your insights. Um, and where can people go to find out more about Butter Meat Co? Uh, our www.buttermeatco.com. Um, we're pretty active on Instagram and Facebook. And LinkedIn is where I tend to post more of the studies or industry news, quote unquote, of dual purpose beef, because there's not a lot of people that like consolidate it. So I tell people, go check our LinkedIn page for studies or news publications or different things that relate to dual purpose beef if you want to follow that movement there so and thank you lisa i I enjoy following your work and um thank you for having me of course thank you all so much for listening to the farm report on heritage radio network if you enjoyed the conversation please subscribe to the podcast rate it and share it until next time this is lisa held The Farm Report is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Just enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.